Hello and welcome to the EMJ podcast with me, your host, Dr. Jonathan Sakia. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ron Daniels, National Health Service Consultant in Intensive Care based at University Hospitals in Birmingham here in the UK. He's also the founder and chief executive of the United Kingdom Sepsis Trust and vice president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. After completing his medical degrees at the University of Birmingham, Ron obtained his diploma in medical sciences at Keele University. He now leads the team responsible for much of the policy and media engagement around sepsis in the UK and internationally, including the adoption of the 2017 resolution on sepsis by the World Health Organization. Ron is also the co-developer of the Sepsis 6 Treatment Bundle, more of that later, which, in, which is in use in, in most British hospitals and I believe 28 other countries around the world. And in 2016, Ron was awarded the British Empire Medal for services to patients. Ron's expertise lies in translational medicine and leadership. As a consultant physician, Ron has worked with the NHS over the last seven years to ensure that more than 80% of patients presenting with suspected sepsis in England rapidly receive appropriate antimicrobials. And he's ever mindful of the perceived conflict and the synergies and need for collaboration uh, with the antimicrobial uh, stewardship agenda, something that we've talked about on this podcast. Listen to these statistics. Over the last uh, 60 months, I want to make sure I get my numbers right, 60 months, Ron has delivered 237 scientific talks, including to the World Health Organization, the European Commission, and the Royal College of Physicians. He's chaired 36 sessions and facilitated nine debates at international meetings. He's published 21 articles in peer-reviewed publications and given over 150 national newspaper and television interviews. I'm utterly exhausted just saying it. Outside of his work, Ron enjoys walks with his family in rural Warwickshire, where he lives, and clay pigeon shooting with his son Noah and dog Digby, although I'm not sure I've ever seen a a canine handle a a 12-ball side-by-side. He also owns and loves to drive a a classic motor car that us petrol heads have been talking about. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Ron Daniels. Pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for the kind invitation and the even kinder introduction, Jonathan. Well, it was the, the only only problem I had was was limiting limiting it to what I did say. There's a lot there. So first of all, Ron, tell us about your inspiration for dedicating your time and intellect to sepsis. And I saw a story in your curriculum vitae that that, that speaks to this. Absolutely, and and I think really this was around an alignment of of planets, if you like. It was the early noughties, it was it was 2004, and the International Surviving Sepsis Campaign had recently launched and, and recently issued its new guidance. And at the same time, I watched a young man die in my intensive care unit, and his, his widow, Karen, won't mind me sharing his name, nor will their children, Tom and Emily, but... Jem Abbotts was was only 37 when he died, and he was a a healthy 37-year-old. And he developed sepsis um, in the community, as of course most people do. He uh, was seen in his home by his own GP. He was seen in the surgery by an out-of-hours GP. He was seen by a non-paramedic ambulance crew. And, And really none of them, and remember this was back in 2004, talked about what he should look for. Everybody dismissed his illness as viral, even when he had bluish lips, bluish fingers, was confused and vomiting profusely, couldn't get out of bed. And he was simply told to stay at home and rest. And of course, we all know what happened then. By the time he came to hospital, it was too late to save his life. And I, I sort of looked at Karen and, you know, this young woman with her family's life ahead of her and and thought about their children Tom and Emily who were nine and six at the time and and just thought they don't need to lose their dads she doesn't need to lose her husband this shouldn't have happened we really needed to do something about it and and at the time the surviving sepsis campaign was looking for national steering committees and I joined that and the following year began to chair it and and then my journey really blossomed from there or 
put another way, it took over my life from that point. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's often the case, isn't it, that one uh, one as a physician, when we're um, going through our training, there'll be one or two inspirational people, consultants that we work with. Who I mean, I owe my career in surgery to the the people who inspired me uh, to follow that course. And then there are the patients that we learn from um, and and see from and. Uh, you know, I'll throw a story back at you. I was doing teaching rounds. I was in the United States. And uh, sometimes what I like to do with my the medical students and my residents was ask them to take me to see someone else's patient. And, you know, we the other consultants were all fine with that. Um, and they showed me this. El- we were standing outside this elderly lady's room and she'd had a colectomy. And the, ch- the chief resident was... Um, uh, asked one of the junior guys to present it, who did. And they they were telling me about how wonderfully everything had gone and that she was ready to go home. And I said, no, she isn't. And the chief resident, who, shall we say, was, you know what they say about surgeons, uh, we're always certain we're sometimes right, um, was saying, what do you mean, no, she isn't? I said, she's not well. He said, she's perfectly fine. And he began to recount to me that she was a febrile, uh, a pyrexial, as we might say, that her white count was normal, that everything was fantastic. I said, she is not well. So I'm standing at the doorway and I'm actually doing something very, very bizarre nowadays, looking at the patient. <laughs> and same thing. She had a touch of cyanosis around her lips, but furthermore, there was a smell. There was the smell in the room, that the smell that there was something badly going on. This woman was leaking. She had an anastomotic leak. Um, but, you know, when you're 84, you don't develop a pyrexia mm-hmm. and you may not develop the pain. And, you know, you just basically crash. And I said, can you please call her doctor? And in fact, that's exactly the case. And it was a, a moment of chagrin for the residents. But it's it it, it in flying... As in medicine, if we th- if we try and stay ahead of the patient, think what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Is that a mentality that you use in 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 your work to raise awareness of how bad sepsis can be? Well, I, I, absolutely, and you know, I, I have every understanding and empathy with with the case you've just described, and in the you know, it it's something we hammer into our juniors, isn't it? If somebody who came into hospital in sinus rhythm, has an abdominal operation and then develops atrial fibrillation, you know, they need assessment because it's very likely they've got an intra-abdominal problem, they've got a complication and and perhaps we need a CT scanner or an expert hand on the patient. And absolutely, these, these experiences really shape our working careers. And in terms of what's the worst that can happen, this is really difficult, isn't it, within the NHS? Because of course, We have to remember, I'm an intensive care physician, as you've said, within the NHS, we have one tenth the number of intensive care beds compared with your experience um, in uh, the United States per capita or per acute bed. Similarly, compared with most high income countries in Western Europe, we have around one tenth the number of intensive care beds. So if we're in other countries, the worst that can happen can be adequately monitored and prepared for by bringing the patient expectantly to intensive care, even if they don't require organ support. We don't have that luxury in the UK. We have the privilege to have critical care outreach teams who are our eyes and ears on the patient out there. But we know that the NHS has problems with staffing, has problems with migrant staff, have problems with underskilled staff in many areas compared with how things used to be perhaps 20 years ago. And to mitigate against the worst that can happen, to mitigate against deterioration of impatience that goes unrecognized, we have to upskill our staff, we have to train our staff, we have to encourage them to be, or other organizations to build a culture that empowers them to act, empowers them to seek help, as well as empowering our families. And we've heard recently in the UK, around Martha's rule, which is, you know, really cements the right of families who are concerned about their loved one to a second opinion. So I think this is a long winded way of saying, you know, yes, absolutely, we have to think about the worst, but we have to understand the constraints of the system we're working in. And what we have to do is to put in place redundancies and mitigations.
push to educate people that, you know, here's a really crazy idea. I know I'm not, not supposed to talk about politics. Wouldn't it be a terrible idea to have doctors actually run the health service? I mean, I ran my practice in the United States and I did it with a fraction of the administrative staff that I would need here. And we could do a huge volume of surgery, but I guess that's for a conversation over a beer. <laughs> so, well, I mean, and again, Jonathan, I, I have sympathy with that, but I, I perhaps not challenge it, but, but develop it slightly and, and suggest that actually what we need in our healthcare system is to embrace leadership rather than management skills. I'm sure that, you know, there are brilliant health professionals of all disciplines who can be leaders and we need to nurture those skills. They will be in the current NHS often seen as agitators often seen as a bit of a nuisance they're, they're often not the most corporate people but they might have some of the most brilliant ideas and we need to nurture mm -hmm. that innovation absolutely um, you'll get no disagreement from me on that so as a as a as an advocate for, for sepsis awareness can you dispel a few of the more common myths about sepsis absolutely so i've been thinking about this and and, and really i think i'd like to address two myths that were proposed um in a letter to the Lancet towards the end of 2019, obviously that the, the furore around that then became subsumed by the pandemic, understandably. But, but the two myths within that letter were really that sepsis is primarily a condition of the old and frail, and, and it was described as it can be a friend of the dying. Now, I, I'd sort of challenge that. I, I think there are there, there is a true statement within it. The true statement, of course, is that you are much more likely to develop sepsis as you age. An octogenarian, for example, has around a 20 to 40 percent times higher risk of sepsis in a given year than a working age adult. So, yes, it's absolutely true that you're more likely to develop sepsis as you age. However, there are many more working age adults than there are octogenarians. So the reality is we see people of all ages very frequently. And some of the best data on this recently have come out of New York State, where there's a statewide legislated and very well resourced initiative to improve outcomes from sepsis. And they recently um, published their data for 2019. And it showed that among adults admitted to New York State's hospitals, and remember, this is not a small piece of work. New York State has a population of 21 million people, that among their population admitted to hospital with a diagnosis of sepsis, almost 50% were working age adults. So again, yes, it's true, you're more likely to develop sepsis as you age, but because the population size is much greater in middle age, we see almost as many people of working age as we do older adults. And it's the same story with children. Neonates are much more likely to develop sepsis, particularly if there's underlying health problems or there's an infection in the mum like group B strep than school-aged children. But there are far more school-aged children. So again, New York's data showed for 2019 that among children admitted to New York State's hospitals, more than half were school-age. And again, it's because of population sizes. The second myth that was purported within that uh, letter to the Lancet was that, in the author's words, the, the sepsis campaign had resulted in a doubling of antibiotic use in emergency departments. Now, if that were true, and there is some truth in it again, then that would be rightly alarming. Of course it would. The, the unmitigated consequence of increasing prescribing and administration of antibiotics could be disastrous from an antimicrobial stewardship perspective. So what we did is we we wrote to the authors and, and, and we said, well, you know, where, where did you get these data from? Because they alarm us and we, we need to urgently take action if that's the case. And they, they said the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and we obtained the same data say, table from that organization. Now, what that did show is that not from 2016, but from 2014, a couple of years before the NHS began to incentivize sepsis, emergency departments did double their administration of doses of antibiotics. So the headline was, strictly speaking, correct. We will allow the artistic license, the doubling is a good headline, and they chose a period way before any incentivization. 
But of course, what it didn't take into account um, uh, was that we were using emergency departments very differently in 2019 compared with in 2014, where we were still obsessed with the four hour trolley wait. And I think we'd sort of given up on that by 2019. And of course, a lot of patients were receiving more than one dose, but that won't account for the whole of the increase. But the most important thing is, has it impacted on global prescribing and administration of antibiotics in our hospital? And it had not. Total hospital administration of antimicrobials increased during that same time period by 1%, including in emergency departments. And there's similar data from Ireland. There aren't very good data from anywhere else, including from New York State, but Ireland and England's experiences, you can incentivize better sepsis care without the adverse consequence of antibiotic prescribing pressure. We simply move the antibiotics further forward in the patient journey. So, so those are really the two primary myths that I want to dispel. Sepsis regularly affects people with all ages, and you can get this right without fueling antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, and of course, just to make the point, as we were discussing earlier, is a lot of antibiotic use isn't even in hospitals. It's in it's in farming, and there's something we can all do about that, isn't there? Well, there really is, and and I did one of our own podcasts for the UK Sepsis Trust on this issue. Um, and it, society wants simple actions that they can take to address an existential crisis, and obviously, existential crises will include climate change, will include conflict, will include. Um, antimicrobial resistance and untreatable infection. And, you know, it's, very, it's, it's fine for us to say to people that, you know, don't exhibit antibiotic seeking behavior, use your antimicrobials responsibly, don't share them with other people, dispose of them appropriately if you've completed the course and there happen to be some left for some reason in, in the bottle or in the packet. Now, th those are all actions, but they're not daily actions that people can take. A daily action that people can take is, of course, to reduce their dependence on intensively farmed meat. Now, I do eat meat, but I think, and it, it, of course, this is much harder for people on lower incomes to do. But if you go back to, you know, the time before and immediately and during and immediately after the Second World War, meat was a luxury for a Sunday. And perhaps we need to go back to that. And I think governments need to ensure that people on lower incomes can access good quality meat and non-meat protein, as well as other essentials for the diet in a responsible fashion. Because way more than half of antibiotics are used in animals. Yes, the UK has banned use for growth promotion, but what they haven't banned is injudicious administration of antibiotics to whole herds when one or two animals get sick. And that is one of the big problems here. Yeah, yeah of course, in the United States, uh, farming is largely done in great big barns and the animals are closely packed so infections and issues so they prophylactically dole out antibiotics and you know there's a great book i recommend called the omnivore's dilemma which which looks at this and uh it it, it addresses this amongst other things so yeah great read so talk to us i mentioned the sepsis 6 treatment bundle which you co-created tell, tell us about that so, yes, of course, this started really with, as I've mentioned, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, which is the International Academic Guidelines Group around sepsis. And when their guidelines first came out, and, and as I've said, I became the chair of the UK steering committee for that organisation quite rapidly. Um, but it came to realize, I came to realize that, that really these guidelines were aimed at intensivists and they were, they were aimed at enthusiastic intensivists around this particular issue. There were 58 individual recommendations across 16 pages of the intensive care literature. And it didn't take me long to realize that this wasn't going to appeal to a busy emergency physician, to a busy general physician. Acute medicine hadn't really got off the ground to in any big way at that time. And, and what we really needed to do was to operationalize it. So I sat down with my house officer, one of my critical care outreach team, and um, now Professor Tim Nutbeam, who's a professor of pre-hospital emergency medicine and a consultant in emergency medicine in Plymouth. He was my SHO at the time. And we worked through the academic guidance and we took out the 
parts of the treatment that could be safely and effectively delivered at the bedside very rapidly by a very junior non-specialist health professional. And, and that was really the brief. And, you know, we didn't set out to call it the sepsis six. It just so happens that with input from our critical care outreach team, who were saying that oxygen delivery was very poorly addressed um, and extrapolating the sort of intensive care um, recommendations around cardiac output, uh, addressing cardiac output and replacing that with urine output, because it is a good surrogate measurement for cardiac output, we created something that came to be called the sepsis six. And I think it's important to point out that this has iterated significantly over the years. People who remember it when it was first launched and published in the Emergency Medicine Journal in 2006, um, we, we started off by saying administer high flow oxygen. And we haven't said that for a number of years. So the most recent iteration of it was in 2019, we delivered that iteration in consultation with NICE, in consultation with NHS England, and it now starts with inform a senior health professional. And the element around oxygen is, of course, to correct hypoxia rather than to deliver high flow oxygen. The resources around this are all available on our website. They're all supported and signposted to by NICE, and they are there to be used. So, uh, Ron, you've done many things to address uh, barriers to, to better treatment uh, of sepsis. You've established coalitions, task forces, global resolutions, work with the WHO, governments. What are the barriers to a committed focus and aligned approaches to recognising issues in sepsis? And how do we overcome them? I mean, look, I'm going to challenge you. As good as reducing NHS commissioning incentives from this to that, how do we get to zero? How do we just say it's not acceptable? We have the means of diagnosing this. We have the means of treating it. You've mentioned all the challenges in the NHS. And I'm a big believer, by the way, in leadership and actually asking people, your workforce and saying, here's a problem. How are we going to solve it? Any ideas? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's the obvious ones. And, and, and I'm going to start by sort of sounding, you know, a little bit like there's no hope and a, a little bit of negativity. And, and I'm not going to finish in that way. We have prioritization fatigue. Of course we do. You know, a, an emergency physician will know that there are um, targets for time to treatment for conditions like stroke, for conditions like heart attack, for, you know, trauma, of course. And we're faced every day with an undifferentiated cohort of patients, many of whom are extremely sick. Now, why would we prioritize the person with sepsis over the person with stroke, over the person with heart attack? And it's really difficult. I think the second challenge that we have is that people with sepsis vary hugely. They present in a myriad different ways. Some of them will so obviously be extremely sick with threatened or actual multi-organ failure, and we know that those people need very urgent attention. It's not a sort of golden one hour for antibiotics and source control in those patients. It's a golden sort of three minutes in the most acutely sick. At the other end, we've got people who might technically satisfy a sepsis definition, but they look pretty well. They're not deteriorating rapidly. And in those patients, we probably have got a few hours before we need to act. We can build more evidence. We can perhaps undertake novel pathogen identification and antimicrobial susceptibility testing strategies and deliver a more targeted antimicrobial a couple of hours down the line. And of course, there are myriad people in the middle, all of whom present in different ways. So this is not easy. There's no sentinel events. People don't come in clutching their chest or with facial weakness. People present in a myriad different ways. And of course, the other challenge we have is that we are, as we've conceded, we are understaffed. We have a very high and increasingly complex and increasingly comorbid, unfortunately, patient population. And that paces huge demand on people's times. This is not just the UK, by the way. We did a, a survey with Ipsos Mori across six European countries representing um, Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, um, uh, very Southern Europe and the Romantic language speaking countries and the UK. And the themes were the same. Everywhere is understaffed. Everywhere is finding that their caseload is increasing and becoming increasingly more complex. So to your point, how do we do this? How do we make this a fully efficient and, and a reliably completed set of tasks? How do we reduce avoidable harm 
from sepsis to zero. Now, this is my prejudice. It's a prejudice that is shared by my organization. But really, I think until we have pathways based commissioning for excellence in infection management, we are not going to get there. It's things like it, you know, diagnostics. I've talked about diagnostics. We need to integrate diagnostics in the space of infection much better into our healthcare systems. There are huge numbers. The technology around novel diagnostics for pathogen identification, for risk stratification, for antibiotic susceptibility testing is evolving at a much greater rate than our ability to integrate it into our clinical system. And we need to change that. We need to incentivize innovation. We need to empower innovation, make resource available for people to bring these diagnostics closer to the patient. We need to, of course, continue with public awareness around this, but we need hospitals to routinely be signposting people, delivering high risk patients, such as those who've had colorectal surgery, prostate biopsy, ERCPs and so forth, to written information around what to look for in case of infection if they believe they're deteriorating. We need to signpost sepsis survivors because there are increased risk of repeated infection to support services and even rehabilitation services. But until we put money behind this problem, we are going to continue to be scrabbling around with temporary improvements. I, I, I fear that no longer are we in a situation where 80% of patients who need them receive antimicrobials within the hour. I think COVID has changed everything within the NHS. I suspect our performance is very much poorer than that. And indeed, some data shared by the Health Services Journal earlier this year bore that out. Most hospitals had stopped measuring their performance outside the emergency department. So I think we've slipped a long way backwards and the only way to address this is through effective and joined up commissioning. Um, fascinating. Well, I want to give you some specifics about things I've been involved in to try and improve awareness. And I was doing some work a bunch of years back with antibiotic impregnated central lines to limit uh, in, I believe here it's called CLABSI in America, CRBSI, catheter-related bloodstream infections. And there was another bundle. It was the work of uh, Peter Pronovost and, and others. And that said, you know, for central lines, you must use chlorhexidine, not povidoniodine. You must drape, you must gown and a mask. The line should be for dedicated use. It should stay in the minimum amount of time, that kind of stuff. And, you know, it turned out that he could, with the bundle, reduce... Uh, the numbers. And I think we had nine or 10 level one evidence trials showing that this technology, this device improved outcomes. The cost was de minimis compared to the impact of someone getting, uh, becoming septic. And one of the ways I thought would be kind of a fun way to educate my surgical colleagues who put a lot of lines in, obviously, together with your profession, um, I developed a mock trial which I did at a big surgical meeting where we presented a real case of an unfortunate uh, gentleman who developed a uh, CRBSI clabsy and, and succumbed. And we had uh, an expert for the plaintiff, an expert for the defense. And we had a gentleman who was an MD JD. So he, he was a lawyer and, and a doctor and he sat as the judge and we gave a truncated trial and then we opened it up to the audience. And yeah, there was a moment where some chap stood up and in the face of all the evidence that was presented, all the data, he said, uh, the hell with all these guidelines, the hell with all these papers. I have my experience, which trumps all of this, <laughs> right? So experience, the hell with evidence. How do you resist, uh, address resistance in education? All humans, doctors included, do not like uncomfortable truths. So how do you deal with that? Well, it, it's it's uh, clearly this is an incredibly difficult environment. And, and of course, we have skepticism, which which is very healthy among our health professionals. And we've talked and we don't need to cover it again around the skepticism around 
improving sepsis outcomes fuels antimicrobial stewardship. But really, I think a lot of this is around it, it, people perceive that they're being deprofessionalized. People perceive that if they're given a pathway of care to deliver, if they're told what to do, then they're not exercising their clinical gestalt. They're not exercising their clinical judgment. And, and of course, we, we remind them that we have a very unreliable process in the recognition and immediate management of people with sepsis. And Again, there's a lot of scepticism around that. I think what we've got to do is, is, is really, actually, I'm going to sort of describe the journey the Sceptis Trust has been on. When we started, uh, as we've said, back in 2005, 2006, very few people had heard of sepsis, even among health professionals. They might have heard of it. They wouldn't really have much of a clue about how to define it and what to do about it. Um, and indeed, I remember, uh, and I hope that won't mind me saying, the Royal College of General Practitioners officially told me that sepsis was a hospital based problem and it wasn't seen in general practice and primary care. So we've come a long way. But in those early days, because there was very low awareness among health professionals, we could afford to be pretty didactic, almost, if you like, evangelical about it. You know, there is this set of actions that you can deliver. They will save lives. You must do it within an hour if you suspect sepsis. Our message has to be very much more nuanced now. Almost all health professionals have had at least some degree of training in sepsis. Sepsis is known about. Many hospitals have posters around it, have performance improvement strategies within their organisation. So the message is now much more nuanced and the sepsis six, which we've previously discussed, reflects it. This is around empowering clinical judgment. So all of our pathways have a box that says describe reasons for variance. So if someone writes in that box, I think this patient's just dehydrated. They've had diarrhea and vomiting for three days. And the only reason they've ticked the sepsis box is a low urine output. Of course, that's sensible medicine. You can wait for some blood tests to come back. You can try some fluid resuscitation. And if they get better, they might not need antimicrobials. So we have to reinforce that clinical judgment trumps any tool. We have to reinforce that our culture should embrace clinical judgment and really consider these actions as empowering prompts. So I think to answer the question, which I've sort of skirted around, we have to make the health professionals believe. We have to make them want to do this. We have to reassure them that doing this doesn't deprofessionalize them, doesn't compromise their clinical judgment, make them realize that it is the right thing to do and also reassure them that it doesn't result in the unintended consequence of fueling antimicrobial resistance. Show them the data, make them believe, reinforce this message that yes, some people obviously have sepsis and obviously need antibiotics as quickly as possible. Other people don't fit that mold. We can afford to wait a little while. And as long as we are documenting our reasons, scheduling reviews, reassessing the patients, that is the way we should be managing these people. So I think it's about making it the will and making it the right thing to do. You make a really important point. And I think that there are a lot of uh, um, a lot of doctors who do feel, you know, irritation at the way medicine has gone and that, um, that the imposition of pathways, guidelines and everything sort of uh, erodes their, their standing in the doctor patient relationship. Well, so on a positive, you've raised public awareness of sepsis um, uh, as a UK emergency from 32 to 77% in the last uh, nine or 10 years. How have you done that? And what more can you do? And how can the rest of us help you? Yeah, so um, I, I think the first thing I'd like to say is the UK Sepsis Trust is a is a small charity. There are only 17 of us. We, we certainly don't have a multi-million pound marketing budget. In fact, we, we don't really have any marketing budget. So none of our public awareness activities are paid for activities. Now, where people might have seen us, they might have seen us um, on the side of ambulances. Nine of the 10 English ambulances carry sepsis messaging now. And that messaging incidentally was developed in conjunction with Public Health England as was, as well as representatives of the relevant Royal Colleges. It wasn't plucked out of thin air. So the way that messaging landed up on an ambulance is, is quite an interesting story, actually. Um, uh, there was public pressure in 2016 to the then Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, to deliver 
asepsis awareness campaign. And he, as you would expect, instructed uh, Public Health England to design this public awareness campaign. And at the follow up meeting where Public Health England came with their concepts, we had in the background been developing our own concepts. And Jeremy, in that meeting, listened to and looked at the Public Health England proposals and then listened to and looked at our proposal and uh, honestly, literally just put his finger on the desk on top of our proposed poster and said, I want that one. And PHE said, you can't do that. And he said, I can. I want that one. And that's how we have the messaging on ambulances. It's not paid for. It carries the NHS lozenge with permission from uh, Sir Bruce Keogh, the former medical director. And it's a very effective way of doing things. And we do the same in other areas. So we work with large organisations. We work with Amazon. We work with JP Morgan. We work with Iceland Foods. And, and Iceland Foods have been the pioneer of these relationships. And the message to them is, use your existing dissemination mechanisms to get the message out to the biggest audience possible. So, you know, Iceland Foods started to educate their whole workforce around this. They started to educate their clients, their, the people coming into their shops. They have posters everywhere around sepsis. Their um, chief executive even sort of uh, traveled around in one of their vans uh, on World Sepsis Day, giving out leaflets to people as they were delivering food. So. These relationships, that's just one example. We've worked with Liverpool Football Club, all sorts of organisations to get the message out there. It's never paid for. It's always around forming relationships and it's always about delivery of the right message. And I think probably the best example we have right now is our schools programme. Again, we make no charge for educating children and by default their parents in, within schools. We have key stage lesson plans across all key stages and we've now got well over a thousand schools delivering these lesson plans around sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. So the short answer is this is about forming relationships. It's about persuading organisations to do the right thing without significant financial investment and that's how we've been so successful. Wonderful. So I know that you've collaborated with various nations, Swiss, Saudis, Qataris, World Sepsis Day, which you've mentioned. What are other countries doing well, better than the UK? And how can we commit to deeper international communication in sepsis, antibiotic stewardship? Because the two are obviously intimately related. So what can we as a country do better other than invest more money and all the other things you've talked about to uh, increase our ICU beds? I'm astonished. I didn't know it was that bad because I know in, in America, I would sometimes struggle to find an ICU bed for a patient in planning an operation. Yeah, well, you know, when we're talking about comparisons, you, you mentioned Qatar, and I'm just going to share one stat before I respond to the qu question. So Qatar has a population of around three million people. Um, that, that, you know, obviously there is a city centric uh, city centricity to the population, but but they do have significant rural populations as well. The median time from a 999 call to the arrival of the ambulance in the patient's home or outside the patient's home, of course, um, across the entire country is seven minutes. Can you believe that? I mean, it's just astonishing what investment organizations and admittedly a much smaller population can uh, allow. So what are people doing? Well, I've talked about New York State. New York State has a very legislated and heavily resourced uh, initiative on sepsis and they're, and they're showing significant improvements. They've been published in um, the uh, in JAMA and, uh, and, you know, the world knows that New York State have done really well. We've actually done almost as well between 2016 and 19 with our own non-published commissioning incentive. But let's celebrate what New York State have done. The Swiss have just um, agreed a commitment of 10 million Swiss francs, which is about 8.8 .8 million pounds across the next five years. They've established a steering group nationally and they're, they're really driving change again, obviously, across their slightly smaller population. In other areas, the, the Canadian Sepsis Network is a properly integrated research network across the whole of Canada's healthcare systems, and they're building really good evidence base, both around paediatric sepsis as well as, as well as adult sepsis. New South Wales have an incredible sepsis initiative, um, uh, you know, and, and Western Australia as well. And where regional healthcare systems exist, sometimes the sort of competition that that brings about can really drive transformational change. Um, 
what no country is doing is delivering rehabilitation for people with sepsis. But, but moving on beyond that, I think the UK was leading this race between 2016 and 2019. It absolutely was. We had the sequin commissioning incentive. We had the um, public awareness campaign that, that sort of uh, Jeremy Hunt uh, supported. We, we had significant process and outcome improvements within our English hospitals. We have fallen backwards quite understandably since the pandemic other countries have reinvigorated and really i've only mentioned high income countries at the moment i think it would be remiss of me not to celebrate the brilliant work that the african sepsis alliance are doing there's been huge initiatives in rwanda in malawi in sudan sudan you know despite the conflict have have one of the the most fantastic low income country sepsis improvement initiatives my call as i previously said is to the uk we really need to reinvigorate focus on this we've talked about antimicrobial resistance until we're diagnosing and managing and using diagnostics in sepsis brilliantly we're not going to be delivering our very best against the spread of antimicrobial resistance and we simply have to reprioritize this let me focus on that Ron, because I've, I've been privileged to help bring a number of uh, innovations from bench to bedside, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, in vitro diagnostics, including on working uh, on, on a couple in sepsis, uh, IVDs in sepsis. A banker friend of mine who I'd approached because I was on the board of one of these companies, actually I was the chairman, and I was raising money. And he said, uh, sounds fascinating, but sepsis diagnostics is where good money goes to die. What are the exciting things happening in this space? Yeah, I mean, th this is a this is a question we could spend so much time on, and and you well, know, give us uh, the thirty thousand foot view. <laughs> <laughs> of course, so from a pilot, that 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 means a lot. So, I think we have to learn to segment our diagnostics. We have really great diagnostics coming to the fore in risk stratification identifying which patients are likely to get sick quickly we have much better diagnostics coming to try to help us determine whether something's viral bacterial or non-infective cause of inflammation we have fantastic diagnostics coming through that can identify a whole array of pathogens and their antimicrobial susceptibility within a small number of hours and they the sort of the holy grail there is that we give the broad spectrum antimicrobial for the first dose, but then we routinely tailor appropriate antibiotic therapy for the second dose. There's so much out there. The technology is accelerating at a huge rate. What we've got to do is to bring these effectively into our clinical systems. And at the moment, we are completely failing to do that. In the UK or globally? the issue is global there are exceptions again I, I i don't want to sort of harp on around the the gulf states but you know the gulf states are throwing significant funds at this as well as having smaller and more tightly controlled populations so you know yes the gulf states are doing huge work but really this is around the world there, there's no um exemplar country that has reliably integrated diagnostics no. Well, I think if anyone's going to do it, hopefully you're the guy to do it. And I want to have an offline conversation with you about some of these things because there's some interesting things I think you could be very helpful for. So we've talked about awareness, social media. I, I, I ranted about the dangers of Dr. Google. And, you know, anyone, anyone with uh, access to a computer is an expert. Uh, but you tweet at Sepsis UK and you've got 56,100 followers. Tell our audience, how do you use social media? And by the way, we'll put the handle, which I believe it's called, in the show notes so that people can access it. Oh, that, that's much appreciated. I, I think my use of social media has iterated over the last several years. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, largely influenced by by the pandemic and, and the sort of change in the character of people and other people's use of social media during the pandemic. So it's also been influenced by the change in direction of the UK Sepsis Trust with its health professional message. And I use different platforms differently. So, you know, you, you've mentioned Twitter. 
Twitter, um, I, I tend to try to use 80% professionally, 20% privately. And, and I'll obviously attempt to keep my, uh, my private contributions uh, almost as professional as my health professional contributions. And it, 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 it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that, that Twitter or X has become quite a polarizing space. And and that was never more true than than during the pandemic. And and I got into a lot of trouble during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, uh, this isn't a, a secret. I was uh, called up in front of my trust board a number of times because I was sort of highlighting, really, that there were some unintended consequences to our uh, locking down. I, I wasn't hiding from COVID-19. I wasn't suggesting COVID-19 was a scam. Goodness knows, I'm an intensive care clinician. I know how horrible it was for all health professionals, as well as, of course, the people affected. But I was saying, look, you know, we're starting to see people who have presented to hospital with obvious evidence of sepsis who've been sent away and they've died. And we had case studies and examples of that. I talked about that we're starting to see a lot more people who've been very inactive during lockdown and they're developing complications of inactivity, alcoholism, mental health problems, drug abuse, all of these sorts of things. And it was really very polarizing. People were either very pro COVID, very pro NHS, very pro lockdown, very we must safeguard the NHS at all costs, or they were the sort of what we might call the conspiracy theorists that, you know, no one's really dying of COVID. It's all, you know, made up by the government. And, you know, it, this is a control issue for the NHS. There was no, the, the middle space, the middle ground. Yes, COVID is horrible. Yes, we've got to control the spread of COVID. Yes, we've got to ensure that uh, NHS is able to deliver capacity to people with COVID, whilst also saying we need to be mindful that this is causing a lot of harm to many patients who don't have COVID-19. That was a really uncomfortable place to be. And it's actually resulted in my stepping away slightly from Twitter or X. The other platforms are more forgiving. I use them more socially. So sort of a 50-50 split for Instagram. I, I'm a bit too old for TikTok. I've posted a couple of times. I don't really use it. And Facebook is primarily, um, primarily personal. So yeah, I, I think we've had to evolve the way we use social media is the shorter answer. Yeah. You know, I... Um... I took positions during COVID. Again, I, I write for the aviation press and, and I, I took position and I was actually very ill with COVID. And I recounted my personal story and I was told by some people that I was part of the conspiracy. And, yeah. you know, that yeah, being an industry shill and Lord knows what else. Yes. But a very dear friend of mine in the aviation community wrote an editorial once called The Meaning of Aviation. And it wasn't, what does it mean? It's people being mean. Yeah. Um, and he was making the point that because you can write something and hit send, it's not like writing a letter with a pen, which takes time and your ire, your vitriol can dissipate. It's immediate. And I think as a principle from how I perceive social media, it would be really nice if we could disagree about things, but not be disagreeable yeah. and take contrarian views and have civilized debate like, you know, like human beings and not hide behind, you know, who the hell is writing this stuff. So yeah. good on you for doing that. <laughs> so I have to I have to ask you this. I've got a friend in, in America who was the medical consultant to a very well-known TV show. And I used to, I've never watched the show, but people would say, you know, two people had a cardiac arrest in this program. Not only did they survive, but they ended up having a romance with, you know, this character. And, and I used to chastise him. He says, mate, he says, I'll tell you, when I got the script, I killed that character. I said, <laughs> no, it doesn't make it. And that, then the director changed it. You know, what can I do? I noticed that you've been clinical advisor to ITV's Coronation Street. And for our international listeners, that's one of the longest running uh, soap operas, I guess, uh, on, on British television. You've been doing it for years. How did that come about? And tell us a quick story. Yeah, so Coronation Street, I, so again, for non-UK listeners, this this has been running for a long time. It's got a weekly viewing figure of around 8 million people. It's one of our most loved soap operas. They're brilliant to work for. And, you know, without releasing any detail, I am continuing to um, work with them on scripts around 
uh, raising awareness of sepsis. They are passionate around doing things correctly. So, of course, we have to allow them some artistic license, but they they will always sense check that something is realistic. So, for it, for example, if somebody um, so go, going back to you know the first storyline we worked on, on with them, which was um, young Jack Webster, um, who was you know lovely lovely actor he, i think he was 13 when we did the story but he was he was eight or nine in the script and he developed sepsis and end up ended up losing his limb and um and i was talking to them at the time about um well yes he's on the ventilator he's receiving high dose vasopressors he's got you know um ischemia of his leg um, he is going to have to have an amputation, unfortunately, in, if we're going to slow this inflammatory process down. And they said, well, how quickly is it going to get better when that happens? And I said, well, they'll probably be, then it'll be about 24 hours. He'll probably get a bit worse first. There'll then be about 24 hours of, you know, getting back to baseline. And then probably over the next three or four days, they'll start to reduce support and, and he'll end up gradually coming off the ventilator. That wasn't quite good enough for them. They, they said, well, could he get better within 24 hours? I said, well, it's very unlikely, but we allowed them that artistic license. So within the boundaries of artistic license, they, they do work very well. The story I'd like to tell is, um, again, with the same story, they had me up on set for a couple of weeks, just making sure that everything was, all the makeup and, and the observations, the monitor, the equipment was all delivered realistically. Um, and I think the, the story I'd like to tell is is how... Coronation Street is very much a family. We we all sit down to lunch together every day. The 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 very well known actors, the the um, camera crew, the the script writing crew, people like me who come in to advise. Everyone sits down together in a lovely canteen with great food. Um, and everyone's lovely. Everyone really is so nice, so friendly, so intelligent, so down to earth. No, no one's up themselves. But the, 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 the character who played Jack Webster's elder sister, uh, I'm not going to mention uh, their real names because I don't have permission, but the character who played his elder sister, her off-screen relationship with him, and by the way, they had, you know, uh, people there advocating for him. So I, I met his parents, but he had full time on set. He had guardians to make sure that um, the young actor wasn't, you know, being subjected to anything he shouldn't be. But um, the off screen relationship between his elder, the lady who played his elder sister and him was just as strong, if not stronger than the on screen relationship. They they really, really cared about each other. And I, I just remember her sitting there sort of making him laugh, stroking his hair when he was made up to be in an intensive care bed. And it was just so warm and lovely. And that's really the best story I can tell without permission about Coronation Street is it is just a warm, professional and friendly place to work. So I worked in uh... Uh, Los Angeles for many years and in uh, California for many years and, and I got to look after a lot of people from the Hollywood community and almost without fail I found them to be lovely lovely people very hard-working very sincere um, the way they get portrayed in the press is awful mm -hmm. absolutely awful which is why I think a lot leave the the profession because they're just very hardworking people doing a very public job. And so that's lovely to hear. I, I love it. So I'm going to give you three wishes from a magic genie to improve your your work in sepsis in healthcare. What would those wishes be, Rob? Um, I'm going to use the briefing we've prepared for at the time of recording. We have a change of government in the UK. We have a new health minister. And as you would expect running a charity, I've got a briefing for him. And we, we've got three key asks there. And, and these are asks that are, you know, targeted at the UK, but would be relevant internationally. Um, now, a lot of health professionals aren't going to like number one, but it really is something that can drive transformational change, which is publicly reported performance and outcome data by our hospitals around their recognition and management of sepsis. 
The second I've already mentioned, which is to, to provide resource to effectively integrate these diagnostics into clinical systems. We've simply got to get better. These rapid diagnostics far too often sit in a centralized laboratory and we, we bring in couriers and porters and all sorts of process steps before the prescribing clinician can get the results. We have to work out how we safely get these into our healthcare systems in a much more effective way. And the third thing, again, I've alluded to, everyone who survives sepsis is at increased risk of readmission with infection and sepsis for several years after their episode. There was a Scandinavian study that showed that among working age adults with sepsis, only 57% had managed to return to work one year later. These people need help. They need signposting to support services and hopefully in time rehabilitation services. Those who are at risk of sepsis, as I've said, need to be given routinely printed safety netting information. So those are our three key asks for the NHS, and I'm going to call them my genie wishes for today. Well, I, I hope the genie and that you get what you want and that your, your brilliant work can help improve lives and save lives. Um, sadly, that's all we've got time for today. But Ron, I suspect you and I are going to have further conversations i really like to thank Dr. Ron Daniels for taking the time to be with us today and for everything that you do for patients as a clinician and do for patient populations with your work with the UK Sepsis Trust. And we'll put some information about this uh, in the show notes. Real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. So folks, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple, so on and so forth. And then you'll never miss an episode. And there's loads of great episodes in the archives. Please check them out. And please join us next week for another fascinating, another, it's easy for me to say, for another fascinating episode. Until then, I'm Dr. Jonathan Sackier. Thank you for joining the EMJ podcast. Please, everyone, stay safe, stay well, stay curious. Bye for now. 